I just want to bring up what I was considering as next week's topic is the movements, the flows, the rivers, the trains of thought, the symphonies of life and existence. There are these movements. So you get like the movement of Western civilization. It's like this train of thought that everyone's on and they're rushing forth with it. Whether it's good or bad is the question and whether you should be following that flow. Then there is the flow of your internal being, which is what makes you and perpetuates your life. It is this flow of your life. Then there is this flow of nature, of life and growth and living and expanding on the planet. And the planet itself is this flow. It is a symphony of movement. Then, of course, that symphony in relation to the symphony is a flow of the energy and the planets and the galaxies through the universe. They are these flows. And it's really important to look at those flows and to truly comprehend what they are and what your choice is of how you would like to join a flow, which flow you would prefer to join and be part of. So that would be the topic for next week. And this very much is in alignment with Earth Day and Earth and Mother Nature and to understand who we are and which flow we should be moving into alignment with, the flow of alignment with ourselves, the flow of alignment with the planet. So let me go back to telling you a few stories. Some people wake up naturally by going on a quest for the truth. And that's what we teach. Basically, through this the process of all these talks, that's what I'm doing. I'm actually taking you on a quest of discovery for yourself and a journey to enlightenment and consciousness. I'm leading you through, but this can be a so much more intense and committed journey. And where it comes from is I went on that journey from about the age of 27 and I wrote a book beyond the age of ignorance, the quest for the truth. And then I wrote two other books that followed that. So some people naturally wake up. This is a personal journey of self awakening, increasing awareness, knowledge, skills, raising your consciousness and natural wisdom. In many cultures, there are many indigenous cultures, as Rochelle has said, that have practiced these abilities their whole lives and is their way of living and being. However, this has become very rare in schooled, indoctrinated, and domesticated societies, as Rochelle said. <laughs> Some people need a wake-up call, like an extremely violent relationship experience or a, an NDE, a near-death experience, car accident, something even like a divorce, which is an extreme experience when you've been with somebody for a long time, or the loss of a loved one. And all of a sudden, these people just go on this totally different journey. Some people use psychedelic drugs. Others have used ancestral herbal medicines, which have the properties of these psychedelics. To achieve these altered states of consciousness, for example, the shamans in South America use ayahuasca, ayahuasca and other people, especially in Southern California and New Mexico and that region, they, they use mushrooms. And ayahuasca seems to bring in like a feminine energy and the mushroom seems to bring in a masculine energy from what I've been told. I am not able to go there with these psychedelic substances because even marijuana or weed or grass or whatever we call it can reveal a whole another dimension to you. And I know this personally because I was in America and I had a lot of friends around me that smoked weed all the time. And eventually it came to a situation where they encouraged me to do so. And I experienced a total sort of collapse of my business. I was unable to function in this world. For the first time it happened to me, it was like two weeks. And then I, I think it was the next time that happened to me. I was lost for about six months. I 
actually at one stage ended up in a psych ward because I just totally lost my ability to keep my feet on the ground. So I can't afford to go there because as people say, Dennis, you're really out there. And just in my everyday living and through my intuitive skills, that, that is where I am. I'm in this realm that is totally out there in relation to most people. For some who cannot see or impatient or choose in other ways, they have the right to choose what they do with their own bodies. However, they lose control of their experience and are not masters of their own consciousness and their intuition. And hopefully they're lucky and they are in a safe environment and they have a very focused intent on where they want to go and are guided by a humble, honorable, skilled medicine man or woman, like in with or a South American shaman, or somebody who's truly cares for their well being. Then these journeys to the other side should not be just to get high. They are worthless if the lessons are not brought into our reality, practiced to change their way of life and the reality they manifest as a result to create a better future. Listening to others who have been on these enhanced medical journeys, their reports tell a similar or almost exactly the same experience that I've experienced through my normal, healthy way of doing it. Of course, I chose to use breathing techniques. And as Esther brought up, I focused on extreme exercise like long distance running, sw long distance swimming and long distance walking or surfing and yoga. All of these endurance sports and ways of being connect you intimately with every little fiber of your body down to the tips of your toes, all the way to your fingertips. And also surfing to me is the most incredibly as people would say, spiritual, I don't like to use the word because it's too religious and, and ethereal as it's not real. Um, but this incredible energy experience that you experience while moving up and down in the waves on the swells in the ocean is an absolutely mind blowing way of connecting to your intuition and to nature itself to the motion and the flows of the energy, which is absolutely wonderful. Or with focusing my desire and intent, then putting it out there to the universe and asking a question or whatever with a focused intent in a relaxed meditative state of consciousness. And that's so powerful. The information and the wisdom that downloads to you is absolutely fantastic. Then, through focused intent before going to sleep and lucid dreaming. And then in that lucid dream, bring through uh, dream techniques, bringing that into our world and either writing it down or sitting in front of my computer and literally typing for, I could even go on for as long as a day, but of course I get really hungry and tired by that time. But it's in that meditative beta brain with it, rhythms that you're able to be consciously connected to the universe and download what comes to you. The story is told of this author. His friend says to him, Oh, wow, you're a genius. And he says, no, 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 I'm the genie. The genius is coming in and wafting through me. And it's for me to catch the genius and then to interpret it into my language and my culture and to write it down. So I'm a, a seeker and a receiver and a capturer of, of the intuition and of the dreams and bringing it into this world makes it real. Then speaking to the trees, I just want to tell this because Esther, this would be like really interesting for you. When I, eventually had this major breakup with my first wife and everything, my whole life collapsed around me. And 
I would go on long walks to try and recover. And of course, I would walk barefoot up the road. And I started really looking and noticing the trees and noticing that, you know, which ones are healthy and some had thorns all over them and they have different barks. And I was like really connecting consciously with my environment. Then the one day I chose to let me go and hug a tree. So I'll go up to this tree and I put my hands on the tree. And of course my bare feet on the leaves and digging them into the muddy humus beneath my feet. I breathe in deeply and then I summon all of my energy from the tops of my fingertips and I take it all the way down through me and all the way down into the earth below me. And then I gather it all and I summon it together and I explode it up into the tree. And I feel it like we're racing up into the tree. And then there's a silence and nothing happens. Then all of a sudden, I feel this, this prickling and my hair standing up on my, my arms and all down my back and all over my head as the electricity just surges through me. It's like, whoa, and my eyes open wide and I'm like, whoa, what was that? And there's this natural balancing thing that happens between, in nature. So I gave to the tree and the tree gave back to me. But my relationship with trees over the years this has become so much more that I now actually in Florida, it was my favorite pastime. It's like when I woke up in the morning, I would get out on the road and I loved looking at the tip tops of the tree with all the little baby luminous yellowy green leaves at the top. And it would make me feel so happy. And then I would say, good morning to the trees along the side of the highway. And they would be like, Good morning, Dennis, like with this absolute joy and pleasure and happiness and love, just like, wow. And I, you know, beyond anything that I could say, it was just so beautiful. And you might think that, okay, really? Now he really needs to go back to that, uh, those sort of whatever, the, the, <laughs> the medication and the room that he was in. But in actual fact, it's not, it's so real. And, um, then one more thing about plant life. Let me tell you a story. I was on this quest to discover the essence of reality. Now science and physics had, did not have the answers. So the one day we were walking, my first wife and I were walking down this beautifully wood, uh, tree lined muddy road down past this old house that had been burnt down and with the ch our children and we walked through and we explored and, and we went down a pathway down to a dam and there was long grass all around and then there was this clearing around by the dam so i laid out a blanket for sharon and uh, under the tree so that she she would be comfortable she had a very sensitive skin and my children went running down to the water's edge to play but i was in this incredible incredibly relaxed meditative state. So I strolled off and I got to the edge of the grass and I sat down. Why there? Don't know. But there was this one stalk of with grass seeds and leaves of this this long, tall grass right in front of my eyes. But I sat there and I said what is the essence of reality? What is the essence of reality? Looking at the seeds, like focusing on the seeds and just like disappearing down the rabbit hole, I started going deeper and deeper and deeper down into the space within the seed which grew and expanded as I went deeper and deeper into the space in the seed. And I went deeper and I went down to the cells and down to the actual like structure and then down to the atoms. And then I got to this place. And immediately there was this all knowingness. It's like, Oh my gosh, that's what it is. And I jumped up excitedly and I ran to Sharon and I said, 
I know what it is. I know what it is. I just thought, I know what it is. And she said, okay, what is it? And I said, well, uh, I can't explain in words, but I know what it is. I really do. And what I, it took me many years to, to get the language and the, and the, the, the proof of what I had seen. And really what it was is energy waves, vibrations combines with energy and it spins. But it's not spinning in one place as modern science and objective science teaches that that is an atom, it's a thing. It's actually spiraling forward through space as the planet spins. And as we move through space, it's this combination of energy movements, which is what we call atoms. And that is the essence of our world. And Einstein proves in e equals mc squared that you know energy comp can energy and mass are interchangeable. It can either be energy or it can be mass. And that's in e equals mc squared. And because it takes in the speed of light into account and so on. And we, it's proven through the atomic bomb that that's true, that this mass can release this immense amount of energy. So what I'm saying is true and it's proven, but it just takes it a little bit further that it is this flow that we are all st sitting still relative to the seed. So therefore we perceive it as a thing, but in actual fact, the energy is flowing through space, which is absolutely fans fascinating and fantastic. Anyway, so the, my development of my theories and everything and my whole philosophy is based on the fact that we live in this vibrating cyclical motion universe. All right. Um, I was going to tell you some stories, but that was, those are two for me. So anybody else who would like to tell a story? Uh, I'd like to interject. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So as I'm listening to you, I, I have these thoughts running through my head of different belief systems. You started with the Western the movements, uh, maybe the sharing of knowledge or the sharing of energy of our uh, atmosphere that we create, not only with our words, our body language, our emotion, um, as we're in this emotional world. But then there's the second and third side of the coin too, that it's just is and that there's this, this story that we are creating, this atmosphere we're creating, we're choosing and making these agreements that these things exist. And then there's the third side of the coin where it's, well, maybe it's the latter of the two that these things do exist. But as you're saying, Einstein with the E equals MC squared, the speed of light, what more mysteries are there that we don't yet know? And just because we can't explain something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, whether that be the, um, way of emotion, the atmosphere, the uh, physical object um, or explanation. Um, I really thought in my mind here, as you were describing your walk with the trees and be able to enjoy the energy through that tree that we are sitting on a pulsating earth. It's always moving, there's always intricate parts. It might be moving slow. I mean, it's obviously moving, trees exist. Once they're big, they look like they're just there. They're just standing. That's, that's the only size they're going to get. But in reality, they keep growing and growing. And then you come back 50 years later, that's not the same tree. That's about 20 feet taller. Well, in any given moment, the growth is slow. And so you might not see the progress now, but maybe the progress next year, second year. Um, there was one thing I wanted to touch base on. Um, how do you get a goose out of a bottle without harming it or breaking the bottle? I don't well, know. It there it is. <laughs> well, there it is. It's out. Um, <laughs> it's more of a joke related. If you didn't get it, that's okay. But that's... the, it's the same concept. You might not realize it now, but all of a sudden, aha, I got it after the zoom meeting and I wanted to tell everybody about it, but in 
Buddhism, and I relate a lot to the Taoist um, philosophy, Buddhism philosophy, in a more Mahayana way, um, where it is intertwined and coexisting. What I mean by that is we have these aha moments, and we know what it is. It's on the tip of our tongues. There it is. But it is a learning moment, and it's a gift. I believe it's a gift. Um, that aha moment that we have, and we just want it again. We want it again, and we become addicted to this. I was speaking with uh, Esther about this a little bit too, and um, it, it is real that we get addicted to this. This, whoa! I just learned something that I think everybody should know. And you go out and tell it, and it becomes a religion. That was kind of coordinating with the joke. If you didn't get the goose in the bottle, that there it is. That's that part. So I'm having two conversations at once. I'm trying to kind of more so not have you be attached to a, an idea or this aha moment. I'm, I'm trying to really kind of stretch your mind here when I'm saying these two different conversations at the same time so that you're not attached to a certain belief or idea. That is the religion of no religion, the belief in non-doing. So when we have this aha moment, and this is what I want to kind of bring it together with, we have these eurekas and once we have them if we try to describe it and define what it is it disappears and um a lot of people don't know i in buddhism and i would be giving it away what it exactly is and i can't really do that because it's an experience but in buddhism that part is the enlightenment and I put it inside the, the notes a little bit uh, about the map of consciousness. Um, I don't really agree with the scale, but I believe that enlightenment in every single one of those categories, if you take a look at that picture by David R. Hawkins, um, you can reach that aha moment in every single level of consciousness. And that's why I, I want to say, don't be attached to the idea here. I'm not trying to confuse you here. I'm not trying to throw you off. I'm not trying to, trying to mind blow anybody. But there is a certain dialogue. And Buddhism is a dialogue, a dialogue that all everything I'm saying is connected to one, this one dialogue that can't be explained. And that's where you have, you know, say a bunch of words in this little space. Imagine like an empty sphere, just that energy you're talking about that twisting that empty sphere of words to describe what this is you can't describe it and once you have that aha moment and you try to describe it it's gone you can't describe it um you can feel it but you want to feel through it feel flow through it once you reach it and once you feel that certain eureka that aha it's a gift that gift could bring a lesson that gift could bring your next step but once you try to describe it or define it, you lose it. And so I guess this whole really thing I'm trying to say is feel through it, see it, be aware of mind, open of it, but let the ahas come and go. That's it. Can I respond to that or would you like to, Esther? Yeah, just Thanks for Austin for bringing that up. Um, yeah, just very simply, when it comes to the aha addiction that I, I called earlier, um, I watched for almost two decades people coming and going in the programs that I was teaching. And it was personal growth, it's personal development, self-help, and Austin's one of those people. And I am not down talking on anything because it served me in those moments of my life to help me move forward. Now, looking back and being in a different level of consciousness, I now I realize why I was questioning, why I, was, why I had this inner dialogue, like something's off when I was, you know, after like a decade or so. And I noticed this repetition of people coming, having their aha moments, having their enlightened moments, having this high, which I've been through too. I, I've been there, so I know what it feels like. And then going out, doing their thing, living their life, and then coming back and going, I'm in a breakdown. 
And it was this repetition, 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 repetition of constant, like coming back. And what I noticed was they didn't come back with the, I'm ready to peel the next layer. It was the same layer of, of paradigms or limiting beliefs or whatever. It was just the same thing. So it wasn't dissolved on its own. It was just touched. It was a band-aid on it with the aha moments, with the mental processing of who am I, what my limiting beliefs is, what a, you know, a comfort zone is and all that stuff. But it wasn't dissolved on the emotional, energetic level and the consciousness that that would have freed them so that they could be like, okay, what's the next level that I'm ready to take a look at and dissolve and move through and free myself off of all the programming, the paradigms, the limiting beliefs, and so on and so forth. So when I said the aha moment addiction, it was this, that's when I had this intuitive guidance going, you have to dig deeper. There is so much more down in the rabbit hole that I was afraid to go down to because I had this paradigm that if I go down into the rabbit hole of all that I've been avoiding to feel, especially the emotional energy of it, I'm going to get stuck in there. But this aha moment of high, I can chase that forever and ever and ever because it feels good. So I love the fact that Austin's here and hearing this because he heard me in that arena too for quite a while. And I'm the first one who say, I'm sorry. I will the first one to say, I'll take 100% responsibility for for sharing and, and spreading that belief and paradigm that it stops at the mind and only scratching the surface of what your emotions are telling you. What is your intuitions telling you? And your emotions and your intuition is connected. And unless we start listening to how we're feeling and getting real and honest about it and actually saying out loud, like, yeah, I admit that I'm freaking out and I'm scared. I admit that I'm sad. I admit that I'm feeling angry. That intuition that we all born with is infinite being. It's not about a lost state. We never lose it. It's always there. We just pile up all this garbage on it. And then we're not aware it's there. So we're programmed. Oh, you lost it. You're disconnected. If I'm everything, if I'm all, and one with everything, which is mean that I am an infinite being. How the hell do I get disconnected from my own self? That to me, it's not even possible in my, in my, in my perspective. So having an aha moment addiction is a, to me, was the place where I lived and worked and existed for a while because that's all I knew until I had the moment of awakening, experiencing myself outside of myself one day and hearing my own voice saying, when are you going to stop living everyone else's vision and start living your own? And I ignored that moment, even though it was real for me and it helped me wake up. That was exactly two years ago this weekend. And I think that's where in my opinion, and don't take my word for it. I, I don't want anybody to believe what I'm saying. Don't take my word for it. Listen to your intuition and, tell you what, and, and ask what resonates with me. But for me, that moment was a turning point, And also I had the free will to resist it and keep going back to what I know out of the illusion of safety and comfort and whatever, which I've done on and off for the last two years. Or I could just finally say, you know what, I'm going to surrender to the unknown and uncertain. And because the shit that I knew up until now, obviously, is not working. So might as well be open to the unknown and uncertain and see what comes out of it and be present with it. So the addiction of the aha moments are this cycle of, I just, I don't want to go past this barrier that feels good. Because on the other side of it, if I actually take action and use what I got from that aha moment into the guided action, actually put it into action, will mean that I'm going to have to go deeper and deeper and deeper in the rabbit hole that I have been piling and piling and piling dirt on all my life or even generations. 
and because of the paradigm says it's going to suck, it's going to hurt, it's darkness or whatever it is that we labeled it as, it's all about fear. And unless yeah. we acknowledge that we are fearful and we're scared, which is step one for me to go face what I really truly want to get out of life and want to experience, we're just going to keep running through this cycle of aha moment addiction, avoiding the emotions that's truly there to talk to us and go, I'm here to help you. Are you done avoiding me? Did you have enough of recreating the same thing over and over again with different places, different places and different faces? Let me know. And that intuition, that part of ourselves, it's always going to be there. Question is, are we going to stop? Are we going to start breathing? And are we going to start breathing ourselves back to presence so that we can actually hear it? And it's nothing to do with reconnecting with something that we are. That's all I got to say on that. Can I respond to that? That's wonderful. It's wonderful stuff. I actually am, I, I hear exactly what you're saying that, of course, the aha moment is um, that we are being called upon and we're being called upon, but we've been told something. We've been given this magical gift, as Austin was saying, we've been given these magical gifts. And if we stay stuck in our paradigm and in our, our fear and and our belief systems, in, in our values and beliefs, if we stay stuck there, we cannot progress to becoming who we intuitively are, were as, as the child within. And we cannot become part of nature and the universe as we need to be, become reintegrated with who we really are. It's a journey of like each one of those intuitions I just, right. I just wanted to say something about what you were saying in that moment. So I was kind of just saying that about what you were saying about um, our knowledge and our belief systems. And I was about to say, but the thing is, is that we don't have any knowledge and belief systems because they've been imposed on us for hundreds of years that we actually don't have any. Um, we've just taken the first that have been given to us because it's all we know. So that's the root of it all is that we actually have to find our knowledge and belief systems and the, the real ones that, that work for us as humans and nature. Carry on, okay. muting. So, so this, is, this is actually fascinating because basically through my journey, I went and I studied Buddhism <clears throat> and I went right down to the essence of it. And I said, okay, what are the founding principles? What is the basis of this belief system? What is the basis of the Torah? What is the basis of, of all of these fundamental belief systems? And of course, I did the same with education and I create mind maps and I'm like, okay, this is a central idea, centralization of wealth and power. It's a fear, fear based paradigm. It's based on fear of scarcity. It's based, and I would read through these religious texts, texts and find out what are their values and beliefs and what are they trying to achieve? Like if you really, really go down and you look at the essential ideas and values and beliefs, and don't just read the story of Exodus, read and understand what Moses was doing. All right. He was creating a pyramid scheme, just like he had been trained in Egypt as the son of, a, of an Egyptian um, king. He was um, adopted son he, uh, of the princess or whatever. He created a pyramid scheme. He got a, a group of people, he got money, he got wealth, he got power, and he built a pyramid scheme so that he was the absolute receiver of 10% of everything. It was all sent up in this power-based system. And he empowered the people by plundering and killing and murdering people around, around and accumulating this wealth and power, creating a pyramid scheme. And it's that belief system, which is a pyramid scheme, which is based on fundamental values and beliefs. Like, private property ownership and, and absolutism. Everything's black and white, heaven and hell, good and evil. Um, segregation, divide and rule, divide and conquer. Um, elitism, we are the chosen ones, we're special. There's, you know, we are this elite group. And you go through and you see the values and beliefs and you're like, oh my gosh, this is horrendous. What are they doing? Then you could say, oh, well, you know, here's the big problem. But then if you go back in history further back, you can see where the mistakes were made in the beginning of, of agricultural society and, and domestication of animals and slash and burn and, and marauding and all that sort of thing. All the mistakes 
and those values and beliefs were all taken and, and literally put together to create these pyramid schemes. So horrendous set of values and beliefs, which are, are what destroyed those regions and then went on to destroy, uh, are going on now to destroy our world because the more we go into the future, that tree of religions that grew from that, um, it, the Muslim religion, the Catholic religion, the blah, the, the medicine, Methodists, the Protestants, the blah, 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 all of that tree of religions that spread around the world are all pyramid schemes. And they're based on those same essential values and beliefs. And while humans are indoctrinated into, and that became the belief systems of our, our education system, and it became the belief systems of our institutions and so on. And if you go and have a look at, at any institution, you can actually go and have a look at the values and beliefs. And even the education system takes it far further. But it's those essential values and beliefs that if you change them to the end, essential nature of the universe, which is love, balance, harmony, movement, everything's composed of energy, flow, um, um, giving and receiving, connectivity, um, we are one, we are all connected, we're not separate, we, we're not fighting against one another, there's no need for wars, we are all the, the war that we should be fighting is for the survival of, of all life on this planet. We should be regrowing and re... So all of those values and beliefs are this whole value and belief system of Mother Nature, and they are the essential values and beliefs of who you were as a child. You were truthful, you were kind, you were sharing and caring, and all those things that your mother like reinforced as you that you were as a child, and she nurtured and she cared for you, all of those things are the nature of who you are. And that's the difference between the two paradigms, all right? That the one is a love-based paradigm, which I'm, I'm teaching, and the other one is, is literally um, a taking, careless, uh, killing living systems to make dead things. It's like this negative paradigm. And basically, we have been indoctrinated into that our whole lives. And now the, the secret is to return into alignment and become one with that love and one with that flow. And that's why I bring up the concept of flows. Um, so, um, so the concept that insights come to you and you must just like, oh, let them go and ignore them. No, 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 don't mis misconstrue what she's saying. She's saying that if that, if you're addicted to just like, yay, I had an aha moment, and then just ignore it. Well, that's a mistake. But if you have an aha moment, and it gives you this gift, and it says, hey, go and do some research over here, or go and travel and find this out, or find some, there's something for you out there. Go, go and do it. Follow that, and live through it, and experience it, and that's where you grow. But if you ignore those little gifts, it's like, I'm a dream catcher. And I've got this dream catcher and the dreams are just flowing through me. And if I don't catch the dream and bring it into this world and then manifest a better world because of the dream that I captured, then I've wasted that magical gift that just flew by me. And it'll just pass you by and disappear. Don't let that happen. So, wow. Is so much more than <laughs> I mean, I've got this wonderful story that that is like to prove that there's actually three of them, but like this wonderful story that proves that what I'm saying is not just airy fairy, it's not just something out there. Do you mind if I tell it? A voice in my head saved my life. It was the 3rd of April 1984. I was heading to work as I had done for quite a while now. I was teaching technical subjects at George Campbell Technical High School. From home, I'd head down the Bluff, Bluff Road and then right down, I'd actually turn, uh, yeah, right down Edwin Swales and I'd turn left down onto the freeway heading north. And then I'd turn right onto the Esplanade and then left into Brick Hill Road and end up at George Campbell, the school. I had this so well timed that I knew exactly what time to leave. I knew where I'd be at what time. And as usual, I was happily singing my Don McLean songs on the way to work, you know, and uh, American Pie, you know, there we go. It like, this was my favorite thing to do because I loved singing because my mother brought, brought us up singing. 
I was about to fly off the freeway to the right onto the Esplanade when a voice in my head shouted at me, don't go that way. And I'm, whoa, and I swerved out of the flyoff lane into the next lane, almost crashing into another car in a state of shock. I asked respectfully if it was all right if I take the next exit, which is coming up fast. The voice said, I just said, don't go that way. But I had already passed the flyoff. So I asked again, rather timidly, can I go this way? As I slowed down approaching that flyoff. The voice said in a somewhat irritated tone, I just said, don't go that way. So I took the flyoff and I went up the, the, the hill, up the barrier, and then I crossed Tollgate Bridge and I, along the barrier, and then I turned down Argyle Road, and I eventually got to the school 25 minutes late. I went into the headmaster to apologize for being late. I couldn't very well say to him, oh, a voice in my head said, uh, take the long way to school, you know. He told me to go and teach. At tea time, I went into the staff room and it was a buzz of chatter. Everyone was like, blah, blah, blah. and I looked up on the wall and there was a TV with the news on a rerun about a bomb blast that had taken place on the Esplanade at 10 to 8 in the morning, exactly where I would have been if the voice had not told me to change my route to school. That voice saved my life. From my experiences of voices of all kinds, extreme interventions like this in my life do not happen often. It is like they have to break the rule or natural agreement not to interfere with people who are living in this re reality, unless it is like an emergency to save our life, my life. Only then is it, is it, is it acceptable because our life is our experience. It is for us to live and learn and to gain guidance when we ask for it. And we have to have that freedom of choice to make our choices and make our mistakes and learn from our experiences. And if they are too protective, that's not going to help us. Just to prove that what I'm saying is true, here's a New York Times article of the car bomb explosion on the Durban Esplanade to prove my story. It happened on the 3rd of April, 1984 in Russia traffic. I will share this link in the article with you. I can do it right now in, in the chat. I have two little, very brief other stories which will absolutely blow your mind. So I had friends of mine over at a barbecue and they all guy friends were like all standing around the barbecue, the fire, and as we were making the fire, when I said, I have this incredible intuitive abilities and two of them scoffed at me and they walked away because we were all engineers and they lived in the real material world, you know, Newtonian physics. Yeah. But my best friend, Peter, who was intelligent and insightful, looked at me curiously and said, then prove it, Dennis. Tell someone the next time something like this happens. So I said, I will. And shortly afterwards, one weekend, I was heading home after refereeing rugby at George Cap Campbell T Technical High School. I was racing down Brick Hill Road, heading home. I was late. We needed to pick up the kids. I needed to get back. And the road and the streets were dead quiet. When in my mind's eye, three women were having this heated, urgent discussion. He must go this way. He must go this way. And I turned to my wife, Sharon, and I said, the voices are telling me I, I, I must go that way. And she said, then go, go. I said, no, in a contemplative state of mind. Then I said, let's go slowly down this road and see what's the reason for them getting so agitated. I drove slowly down the road looking for a robbery or shooting or something going on because this was like very, very dangerous times in South Africa. It was almost total civil war, but it was dead quiet. 
as I turned the corner, I suddenly jammed on brakes and screeched to a halt. Right in front of me was a, a huge truck which was, and trailer, which was overturned with its wheels facing us right across the road. If we had carried on at the speed that we we're traveling at, we would have just smashed dead into that. There was just no avoiding it. We would have been stone dead. So it's really important to listen to these voices. Your life could depend on it. That's it. I, I've got so many more, but, uh, but those are two really important ones that prove that it's not just me like being out there and just I've lost my marbles and it's real. I like to hear from Rochelle uh, about the uh, the Native American intuition that she teaches and stuff. Uh, do you it's, have anything? It's African. It's not American. Oh, did I say? I'm sorry. I should have just stuck with Native. Um, I don't. I don't actually. I don't teach it as such. Um, when I get to, when I get learners that come to me that have been asked to leave mainstream um, environments, um, they come to me with letters from assessment companies where they've been assessed and told that they they cannot fit into mainstream because they are remedial learners for various reasons, behaviour. There's all different reasons you can come across. I remind these learners who they are. And I don't have a specific method that I use. And every single learner is different. I work with each child as a unique individual. And I would find that what works with one child doesn't always work with another child because they are so unique. For example, I've got one little girl that there's something about her when she's drawing. She's very in tune to herself when she's drawing. And she used to get into a lot of trouble because she used to draw even when she was listening and learning in class. And she got told she has attention deficit issues because she is continuously drawing and she's not paying attention. So I basically created a curriculum for her that allowed her to draw anything and everything in maths and English in geography and social sciences and history. And so basically allowing her to do what she loves and where she feels mostly herself, she was able to pick up concepts that she never picked up before because I allowed her to use a process that made her feel happy and most herself. And they're also different. So it's not like I'm picking a specific method or rule that has been applied um, to a certain generation at a certain time of year. It's more about finding what that individual needs and reminding them who they are. But in saying this, I need to learn more about practices, actual practices that were used that I don't even know about in terms of our actual environment that can be used alongside this, this kind of intuitive teaching as a complete process, you know, that forms as a part of a curriculum. Awesome. Esther, anything to say? Yeah, I, I'm certified to do Reiki, Austin, but thanks for bringing it up. Um, the, just piggybacking back on, on what Rochelle said, everything you're saying is everything the programming is against, basically. Everything you're saying that you're intuitively guided to do for these children, for everybody that you're working with individually, to recognize their uniqueness, to, to hold space for them, to be that container so that each and every one of them can be their own unique, authentic self, is everything that the mainstream is against. And that is, to me, goes back to fear. And the very, in my belief, and it's always what I believe in, what I'm perceiving is, is nothing that I want to, you know, impose on anybody to believe. The very people that 
have the illusion that they are in control of everything. The very small, the top of that pyramid that Dennis was talking about, that 1% they call them, whatever, I don't care what you want to label them. The very people, the very organizations that they actually have the, this illusion that they are in control of everybody else, their control is based on fear. Their illusion of control is based on fear. Now, if you, and this is coming from, and now I'm failing it, this is coming from me going through human trafficking because the last week, if you guys see any of my posts from just a few days ago, Everything that I'm perceiving right now as I'm experiencing is triggering everything from 30 years ago. And it's not because I'm freaking out. It's because it's bringing me to the consciousness level of human trafficking is a label that was put out there for people that were using, manipulating, and taking advantage of people's vulnerabilities, their basic needs for love, acceptance, home, shelter, food, water, air, whatever, and seeing an opportunity to prey on that, seeing an opportunity to gain out of that. How is this any different from what we're experiencing as, global, as, as a global community right now? I don't see a difference in it, except it's my perception that creates a difference for me. So knowing that experience, the very core of human trafficking and, the, and, and what I'm seeing, the very core of the people that really want to think that they're controlling everything, is fear. It's their own fear of being out of control in their own lives so that they want to create this illusion of safety for themselves by trying to control everybody else and calling them the most powerful one. It's the same concept in human trafficking. I will control you. I will tell you what you can do. I will feed into your vulnerabilities and I will make sure that you're afraid 24 seven so that you will not be in touch with your intuition to take action based on that. It's the same thing to me. So to to be in the space where you're in, Rochelle, where you're absolutely trusting intuition, and I'm guessing that you're freaking out more, more times than you like to admit it while you're doing it, because a lot of stuff that you're being guided to is not making logical sense based on the programming, and that fear of being judged and criticized and shamed for being true to yourself is there. And that's one of the greatest tools that people that always want to control out of their own fear of not being in control of their lives is what they use is shaming, shaming for you to be in truth, shaming you to have a different opinion, shaming you to doing something that is unorthodox in their perception. And that is one of the greatest tools that has people in power, in the illusion of power, been using for generations and generations and generations to keep that illusion going, is shaming those who are willing to show up, who are willing to speak up and willing to trust themselves and be a little unorthodox away from the programming. So what you're doing is basically you're creating an environment, a, you're holding a container for each person that you're working with, reminding them that their truth is their power. And that's something you said, Denise, about empowerment. The very empowerment for people, in my opinion, is by being in my own power and modeling that instead of trying to tell people what that feels like. Because empowerment, the word power is right in there. And where is that power that we're looking outside of ourselves? It's within ourselves. So going back in the full circle, the very people who want to tell us how to teach the kids, what they need to learn, and creating these systems of education and medical and military and whatever systems are the very one who is the most afraid of their own truth. And the only way they can control that fear is by trying to control everybody through fear. So going back to the pyramid and what popped up when we were talking about it was Maslow's hierarchy. You're mentioning the 1% on the top of this pyramid that is a pyramid scam. And then my Maslow's hierarchy popped up for me, which is based, the base of that pyramid, which we all being guided to, to go back to now so that we can build a stronger foundation than we have ever built for ourselves away from all that with depending on other people thing and trusting ourselves and knowing that we can take care of ourselves, food, air, water, shelter, and that being the bottom line foundation for every single pyramid we built from now on moving forward. 
and learning for what we have done and built up until now. But that requires us to turn within, get real, get honest, breed ourselves back to presence and trust our intuition and take action based on that guidance from every single aha moment so that we can finally be free, the true freedom, not the illusion of freedom, of someone will give me what I need and I will be free. That is the biggest brainwashing BS that I have ever seen and heard in my life. And now I get why I've always been such a resistance to the norm. At least now I'm getting honest. Hey, soon, you know, better now than, than ever. So thank you, Rochelle, for doing that because I know it is going against every logical training that we have been taught. But that's really what makes the biggest difference is you trusting you and just keep moving with it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank that's you. wonderful. There's so many interesting concepts there. Alex and I wrote a book together. We bounced ideas off one another and it's called The Feminine Revolution. And it's women that have been disempowered more than men right throughout history. And it's really because it's a male dominated pyramid scheme. And it's really important because I go through the, the description of what has happened, what you can do, what were the problems, what's the problems with our education system. I take you through like this whole journey and what is the natural wisdom and the ancient indigenous cultural wisdom, which is essential for us to, and, and of course the modern, combined with modern scientific proof and wisdom and, and whatever, com combined with this wisdom that I've acquired through intuition throughout my life, that we wrote this incredible book and, um, and the five or so people that, that read it gave me five star ratings and it's like, wow, you way ahead of your time and so on. It's not that I'm promoting a book here. I'm just saying that if you want like incredible insight, you really need to read that. It will blow your mind. And of course, Rochelle, I basically took my grandson who was suffering, was actually hospitalized twice and he was on Ritalin and they had him in a remedial school and they were absolutely destroying him. I managed to take him right back to the beginning of, of schooling and by paying particular attention to his nuances, his, the way he behaved, changing behavioral characteristics and whatever, and really listening to him, I was able to literally transform his, his life. He's now able to read a hell of a lot better. I mean, he, he, he could not say his ABCs and he was in grade two or something. So I took him right back to grade R, R, whatever it is right in the beginning. And then I took him all the way through and he's doing so much better, but I only took him that far. And just recently, Alex has decided that she's going to go more towards what he enjoys doing and teaching him through those methods. And instead of like using the um, internet system, which we were on, which was like, do the sum, do the sum, do the sum, do the sum. Oh, you made a mistake. Go back five steps. Do the sum, do the sum, do the sum. Oh, you made a mistake. Go back five steps, which was absolutely destroying him emotionally. We have now gone to a more of a creative way of, uh, of teaching him. And he seems to be doing very well at it. So I think with children, we have to, we have to pay attention. I mean, the future is in our children. I've had learners that have been kicked, they're eight years old and they've been kicked out of five schools. Yeah. At it's eight. Like, what? Five schools, you've been kicked out of five schools. We cannot handle this child in a school. He's only eight years old. And it, it's really a mismatch between these wonderful beings that are coming Bring in. Bring it on. <laughs> make a difference in our world. They're coming in creating like to be the future generation, which will save our planet. And they are these creative, incredible beings. And the paradigm is being imposed upon them. And you will do, and this is an authoritarian rule and a male dominated system. And you will do, you will do. And ultimately it's doing such damage to these children. And we need to change our education system. It's the bottom line. We, we absolutely have to. I'm laughing over here because 
the and this is why I'm so unconventional. I so don't care what anybody thinks about it because it's just been my greatest freedom ever to finally just surrender into my unconventionality, if you please. And I like to make up words, so here, that's one. As I'm being this jaguar that I learned this method is just to to be curious and to like jaguars are curious and this pause and they present and they stalk everything so being a jaguar in my life and stalking not in the sense of what stalking is in the legal system but it's just being that present and and breeding and just knowing when to make move from that intuition so as I'm stalking everything these days and I'm being curious and I'm starting to ask questions that in the past I allowed my fear not to ask. What I'm noticing is a lot of things that some might perceive, oh my God, this is the end of us. I'm looking at it, oh my God, this is the greatest blessing on the planet. Like, mm. like so is- we're talking about educational system right now. We're changing the school. Guess what? the very people who out of fear decided to create this experience globally i'm I'm not getting into any theories by shutting down everything out of fear and this is this coming out of fear i don't want to lose my control as a matter of fact i want to gain more to feel safer what they created from my perspective is that they put the end to the educational system as we know it up until now they sent the kids back home into their own environment with their families did their parents with their siblings and gave them the power back to the parents and the education educators to be doing moment to moment the best they can with what they have knowing that they do not have the structural setting where they can control the kid based on the programming they were taught. I was watching some of these videos from families, they're posting what's going on, how the kid is like in front of the computer, like jittery in, her, in his you know, chair, but they are at home and they feel a lot more confident when they are home to do what they call to do just moment to moment. And kids are like that. I get it. I have a two-year-old niece and I love her to death for being so amazingly authentic while my family's freaking out over don't do this don't do that I'm just like yeah whatever so I'm seeing this as an amazing blessing thank you whoever decided to take action out of your fear trying to control the world globally and ending the educational system in a way that we knew it up until now which you created to try to control everything because now Rochelle, you're at home. You can do whatever the heck you want. Parents are at home going, wait a minute. And those are that are awake and ready to be awakened, they, they will notice, like, something's off here. Why is my kid doing this? Oh, are they going to put, the, you know, just the pieces together of what the school has been saying about their children, what the teacher has been saying about their children, and what they are experiencing with their children while they're learning? of the behaviors, of their responses, of all that stuff that's going on. And to me, it's, I'm laughing about it because I think it's one of the greatest blessings right now to be an interruption in a programming that has been talked about, brought to light, but has been shamed again and labeled as conspiracy theory. But right now, everybody's having a hands-on, down-to-the-cell level experience of oh, what the hell is going on here? So, and, and, it's, and I see it all over the place. I see it in politics. I see it in different structures that was created. And I said this before, and I'm just going to keep saying this for the last couple of years. I am nowhere, anywhere political. I don't believe in the left or right and none of that. I'm, I'm, these are human beings having their experiences. And the biggest human error that we have ever done is separation based on religion, politics, data, all that stuff. The separation, separation, separation. However, I'm seeing more and more of a blessing in all that stuff that we have been shaming for the last few years. And it's not about the person that I agree with their action. It's what their actions are actually perpetuating right now that is becoming a blessing for so many people that we have been either blinded from 
in, in, in a mass media because they only give you what they want you to be programmed for in the first place. And, and watching the very people, and I had to drop my guard for this. I had to stop. I had to sit and go, what is it that I think and believe that I know that is actually blinding me from seeing what is? So me thinking and believing that the United States president is an a-hole and he doesn't care about anybody that was blinding me from seeing all the stuff that he actually done in the last, and that doesn't mean I agree with the guy or I, or I, or I you know, bless him for his behavior, but all that belief and thought that I believed of myself knew that I was programmed and fed to blinded me from seeing all the things that were really happening in, 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 in certain areas. And to wake up to that and have that consciousness of, wait a minute, if I truly believe that we're all one, that means that darn president in the, in, in the White House is me also. And how is he showing up for me that I can look into my own eyes and see what am I believing about myself and life within myself that you're showing up that way for me. And that's why, that's why I'm not that I'm careful, but I'm more present when it comes down to having conversations with people on different topics, because I will say the darnest thing that people just freak out over. And I think that is one of the greatest thing of waking up is just being present and saying my truth. And for Rochelle to teach that, not even teaching, reminding those kids to do that in their own unique way, through art, through whatever, that is the greatest power. Reminder. You're not giving them their power because they have them. But they forgot because of the labeling and the judging and the shaming and the criticizing but you are reminding them their own power, not giving them their power back. And through that, you're reminding yourself your own power, which nobody ever took away from you. It was just buried under all that programming and shaming and all the other crap. And how can we see what is front of us if we're wearing the glasses of shaming and programming? All we're going to see is what's on the glass. We have to clean the glass. That's what we need to, we need to clean the glass, which we need to dissolve the, the paradigms, the programming, the beliefs, the emotions that we attach to them and get real and go, I'm done listening to everybody and telling me what I need to, should, could, would do in order for me to be safe and free. I choose to be free. And from there, I will perceive and make choices from my inner self. How does that for taking your power back? So that's what I'm seeing you doing, Rochelle, in a nutshell. And God, I love waking up in the morning these days and remembering that this is all just a giant global reset and awakening. And no matter, no, no matter where I've been, no matter where I go, this moment is the only thing I have right now. And I, and I truly hope that people recognize that. And regardless of our differences in views or values or politics, I don't give up, whatever. Those differences are still us. And if you can't embrace that and love that, then we are in huge trouble. Thank you. That was wonderful. I basically care about our world. I care about our future. I care about changing the paradigm, ensuring that we live in a love-based world as opposed to a destructive, killing, uh, destroying our world type of philosophy. So I think... At some stage, you you need to decide, are you going to live by love or are you going to live by fear? And the paradigm that we've been indoctrinated in is fear and destruction and harming and, and all those things. Do you, Is that what you want or do you want to live by a love-based philosophy? And there are many Republicans who go out to their garden and grow their own food and care about nature and about their children. So, and then they're very, there's as many if not more, uh, Democrats who do the same. And then there are many that just fight with one another and get caught up in this in this conversation that's just like, oh, he's gay, he's a lesbian, she's a lesbian. And it's like, oh my gosh, just let's change the conversation. 
And that's what we're doing here. We're changing the conversation and then we're putting it out there for the people of the world. And if other people hear us and see the possibilities, all of a sudden, it's like we're passing on the gifts that were given to us by the genie and we're passing it on to somebody else. And that's the magic that of the power that we have to transform our world. It's not, I'm not going to tell you that uh, or force you to come across this bridge to a better future. But if I show you the magic that's on this side, you're going to want to come and you're going to want to change your life and live by love and live in an incredible world. And the more people that come over this way, eventually it'll just become like this landslide of a, a total paradigm shift. But we have to, to be out there bringing the magic to people and sharing it with them. It's like, that's our job. That's our, you know, if we're not um, opening their minds and opening, the, sort of like freeing them from the, 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 the boxed way of thinking, you know, born in a box, live in a box, eat from a box, sit watching a box and your whole life you're in boxes and you get to the end of your life and what do they do? They put you in a box. It's like, no, you don't need to live like that. You could have lived an amazing lifetime. I think that's my journey and my gift is to find out what it is that is the cause and the, and the essence of our problems and then bring that truth and wisdom to people and share it with them so that they can make better choices and ultimately will end up in a better future. That's why the book is, is the quest for the truth and quest means questioning. In other words, this journey of questioning that I went on to discover what it was, what is the essence of reality? What is the truth? Who am I? What am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? What, what is my purpose? What is the reason for life? What is the nature of the universe? What's the nature of who, of, of life and nature itself? And all of these thought journeys I go on lead me to this place of like, oh my gosh, that's absolutely incredible. And then it's my journey. It's called the hero's journey. And if you read, what's his name? Something Campbell. He talks about the hero's journey that's, that's within all of these ancient fables and how you, you have an issue and then you prepare for your journey and then you, you head out and you go on this journey and you face all of these obstacles and things and trials and tribulations happen to you. And eventually you reach a state of like, Oh my gosh, I've learned, I've discovered, I've changed. And you come back to the village and then you sit down to tell the children. And it's not necessarily that they're children. You go there back and you share your knowledge to empower the people who were left behind, who didn't travel with your knowledge, skills, and wisdom. And then they are empowered to take the paradigm or the thought journey and go even further. And that's, you know, the essence of what we're doing. All right. I'm fried. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. That was absolutely wonderful. Have Thank a wonderful you, weekend. Thank, Thank you. Good to see you guys. Enjoy the rest of the day. Mm, have Thank a great you. week ahead. Yep. Cheers, day seven, no smoking. Day oh, sorry. seven. Day nice. seven. Nice. Well done. Awesome. Yes, the, yeah. yes, the, one thing, where are your um, your posts? Just on Facebook? Um. Yeah, it's in my my profile. I did one a couple of days ago, I think. Oh, okay. it's called, it, it, it starts with uh, Am I Listening? That with okay. big giant like capital letters. That's the first sentence on the top of it. So okay. get rid of it. If you go on my profile, you can find it it's a couple of days ago. So. All right. Excellent. Go well. Bye. Have an awesome day. See you later, alligator. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.